Good morning and welcome to worship here at Living Word Lutheran Church on YouTube. I'm glad that you are here worshiping with us wherever you are um, worshiping from. I know we got people that have been here worshiping from the East Coast, Arizona, back in the Midwest, around here in Washington. And it's just so fun even to think about um, the church, just how, how big it is. And it's not just about the local gathering, it's about brothers and sisters connected all over the world um, through Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that's why we come together here, um, is to give praise and, um, and worship and glory to God uh, for what Jesus has done to give us the hope of the resurrection until eternal life. So welcome. I'm, I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, we are going to be... Um, worshiping, we're going to be having Holy Communion together, so if you want to partake in that, you can get your, your elements ready to go, and I'll explain more when we get to that time. Uh, a couple just quick announcements here. Um, if you get the email, uh, even if you don't, uh, we got um, Lent coming up, a uh, week coming up here. Um, uh, February 17th is Ash Wednesday. So a week from Wednesday here. So it's coming up very quickly. In the lifeline, we have a, um, a list here. We have the, the, the schedule, what's going to be happening. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We'll have Ash Wednesday worship, uh, 7 o'clock, uh, Imposition of Ashes. And we'll also be having an Imposition of Ashes from 12 to 1 that day for those who can't make it out to the evening service. It'll be just be a short little um, liturgy and prayer and then the ashes on your forehead. Um, we'll have Lenten services. On Wednesday night this year, so Living Word members, just take note. We were, we've been doing Tuesday for the last four or five years. We're going to Wednesday because we can. This is our building. We can be in here whenever we want. Um, so Wednesday, 7 o'clock, that will be live streamed. It won't be not, will not be in person. No soup suppers this year. I'm sorry. Um, we have great soup suppers here, so I'm going to miss that. But we decided against doing that this year, um, hopefully next year. Um, so live streamed on YouTube at 7 o'clock Pacific Time. The preaching focus is I'm going to be working through 1 Thessalonians. Really excited about it. So 1 Thessalonians will be that. Um, and then, of course, we have Palm Sunday, um, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. That's all normal, 7 o'clock. And then this year, an Easter, um, an Easter, uh, April 4th, we're doing a sunrise service, 6.30 a.m. And Weather permitting, you know, we're going to start outside and we're going to be praying that the, you know, we got a beautiful sunrise with a mountain and everything right there. And so 6.30 a.m. in person and then the YouTube live stream will be at 10 o'clock. Just notice the, the, the different time there. Um, so there will be two services in person, 6.30 a.m. sunrise and then the YouTube live stream at 10 a.m. I'll be doing that from my home. So I'll do the service here, run home, and then we'll have worship together um, like that. So we've got a couple different options. So a lot of stuff. Um, check the website, uh, Lifeline here. Uh, call the church if you have any questions. Excited. I'm super excited uh, about what's coming up here. So, All right, and that is it for announcements. So let's take some time here to prepare for worship. And to focus on why we're here. You didn't, you didn't turn on your computer or TV for um, some guy in Washington to entertain you for an hour, 15 minutes or so, whatever it is. You came here to worship. And so let us close our eyes. Let's, let's focus on the cross. Let's focus on what God has done. Let us um, hold at bay all that's making us anxious, worried, whatever it may be. Let's, let's go to our desolate place, wherever, how, however that looks for you, and let's pray. Ah, holy God, we praise you. We praise you for what you've done for us in Jesus. That's why we're here. We're here to worship. And so I ask that you may bind to Satan and put your hedge of protection around us that he may not interfere with this time. That he may not lead us to destruction. That he may not um, bring up worries and uh, anxieties and cares of this world. But may we fully fo fix our attention upon you, O oh God. You are worthy 
of all that we can give and more. Oh God, you are an awesome God. We love you and we come to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us sing. Um, if you have a green LBW, it's number 520. Give to our God immortal praise. Let's move into a time of confession. And let's continue this theme of the, the desolate place, shall we? Remembering Jesus went to desolate places often. Just him and the Father. That's it. To pray for communion with one another, intimacy. And so let's, let's, go to your, let's go to our desolate places, and I'm not asking you to leave this wherever you're at or go outside in the garage or whatever, but you need to close your eyes, need to focus, and just make it about you and the Father, and that's it, because he, he, he's listening. He is there as we make our confessions. He knows what's on your heart, what's on your lips before you even say it. And so just you and God, just offer up those confessions and let's hear a word of forgiveness. Holy God, you are our awesome God. You have shown incredible love and mercy, but we are not deserving of any of it. We are sinners. We have disobeyed. We have fallen away. We have gone after our own desires and passions. We have tried to do things over and over on our own with no thought of you. We violated your law and your precepts. Oh God, hear us. Hear our prayers. Receive our confessions. Have mercy upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Almighty God, his mercy has given his son to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. And so as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore boldly and confidently and joyfully announce unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's get your Bibles out. Hopefully you have your Bibles with you. We're in worship, after all, right? Um, if not, you can listen. 
And we're going to be starting in Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. We'll be reading from the ESV version. You can follow along whatever version you have. Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Amen? The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God and the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we're going to be in the ninth chapter, being verses 16 through 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 23. Paul writes, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights, my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a, as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law. That I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law, but outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I became all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now... From the Holy Gospel of St. Mark, the first chapter, reading verses 29 through 39. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that's why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
What well, grace, peace, and love to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Ministry is really quite easy when you think about it. The problem is, we either make it more difficult than it has to be, or we think we're doing just fine when actually we're just waiting in the kiddie pool missing the golden opportunities. Or we are simply unprepared or unaware of the open doors around us. I mean, think about it. How many times have you encountered the situation when you had a golden opportunity to share Jesus but did not, and then afterwards were kicking yourself for not saying anything? Been there, done that. Or maybe you just felt completely lost on what to do in ministry. Or scared because you felt out of control. Or worried that things seemingly were falling apart. Been there, done that. Did you know? Jesus makes it very easy for you and me. Did you know that ministry is not rocket science? Did you know you are not in control? Yes, ministry should be quite easy, especially when you think about what your marching orders are and from whom they came and the fact that God will bless your faithful work. May you and I indeed become all things to all people, that we, through Jesus Christ, of course, may save some. And doing so for the sake of the gospel, which is for the glory of God. Let us pray. Yes, God, you have called me to this moment to proclaim the gospel. You have called me to this moment to take this scripture that has been placed before us and read to expound on this, to proclaim the truth in this, I praise you that the success of what happens here is not dependent on me and my skills. For I'm not a good writer, preacher, or speaker, and if this task were left up to me, I would surely bring it all to ruin. But it's all about you. May your Holy Spirit take these words and fill us and strengthen us and enable us, embolden us to go out there with your marching orders and glorify your name. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Well, today we're in Mark chapter 1. I know we were in chapter 2 last week. We're going to back up here. We're going to, we're going to move on through Mark and get some other texts later on here. But um, my focus today is going to be verses 35 to 39. Okay? But I, I want to take a peek at 29 to 34 here as I springboard into those is verses and take a look at what a Sabbath day looked like for Jesus. What did a day of ministry look like for Jesus? Thought about that. We, we get bits and pieces throughout the Gospels and, and we see what Jesus did, but what did a day look like for him? That's not to say that every Sabbath day looked like this point for point, but it would have been exactly the same when it comes to purpose and definitely the content of the message. So just Let's go back to verse 29. It says, after he left the synagogue. Now, earlier on in verses 21 to 28, it says that he's been, he was in the synagogue. He's teaching on the Sabbath day. And in Scripture, the Bible says that it was the custom, his custom to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which would have been a custom for all Jews at the time. Um, the synagogue was a very important feature in the Jewish culture, life and culture. Um, like the church in America once was. I don't know when it stopped being that way, but maybe some of you remember that the church used to literally and figuratively be the center of the town. Towns were built around the church. I mean, the center of activities. I mean, think Little House on the Prairie. Remember Little House on the Prairie? The church, the school was there, the, you worshiped there, um, there were some town meetings there. I mean, that was the center of town, really, wasn't it? 
Interesting tidbit, Walnut Grove, where the Little House and Prairie is, just 40 miles from where I used to live in Jackson, but I digress, sorry. <laughs> but you know, you, 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 see the, you see the picture, right? It used to be uh, the center of town. In Jackson, where I served for 12 years, town of 3,500, seven churches in town. You know, but church in the center of town, seven churches. Two ELCA, Missouri Synod, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, and Catholic. We got along. The ministerial was great. I mean, the Catholics didn't always join the stuff that we were doing, but we got along. And plus, you had a, lunch, a lot of other country churches around Jackson. So there was, it was a big ministry. My point is, there was a strong church presence, but the community wasn't, not, it wasn't centered around the, the, the church. We, we were into different groups all over the place not including other non-Christians that were around. The church is no longer the center of the community like it once was. Jesus went to the, the synagogue, and that's where, at least all the males, the, the, the males went to the synagogue, the women did not. That's where they gathered. Every, and so when Paul was out there, the synagogue, that was the place. Can you imagine if that was still true today? And, and, and the other thing about the synagogue, it was the place. You didn't have the conservative synagogue over here. And then on the east side of town, you had the liberal synagogue. And then you have the one for families over here. And then the, the senior citizens went to that synagogue over the north end kind of thing. You, you didn't have that. Synagogue was a synagogue. In this synagogue, the, the main activity was reading the Torah, reading the prophets, instruction and sermons, okay? That was it. Um, some sources talk about communal prayer, but that really wasn't a big thing in the synagogue. It would probably be more the temple thing where you had sacrifices and other rituals and things like that. Private prayer was very huge. But the synagogue had a teaching focus. And Jesus did preach. I mean, there's, there's a difference between teaching and preaching, really. Um, we're not going to get into all the nuances there. But Jesus was there. He was teaching. And then it says he goes into the house of Simon and Andrew. It's probably the same house mentioned in Mark chapter 1. And where there it says that Jesus was at home. Okay? So he's with Peter. Um, and so the, a chunk of his day is spent at the synagogue. We don't know what time it started or anything like that. But they spent a chunk of that day teaching, preaching. He's healing. We see, we, we see that in the earlier verses here. And so he's in that house um, doing ministry now. I mean, the synagogue is done. Now they are gathering. Now verse 30, 31 talks about how Simon's mother-in-law, so obviously Simon was married, or is married, or in this text he was, and with a high fever, um, probably close to death, she's not able to do what she normally does. Her job would have been to serve the man when they came back from the synagogue. I'm not trying to be sexist or anything. It's just the culture. That was what they did. Um, and they came in, she, she took her by the hand, and the fever left her, and she began to serve. So he, she was immediately healed. There was an immediacy of right now, um, complete restoration. That's what Jesus does. He brings restoration, and he healed this mother-in-law. He never missed a moment to heal. He never, he's not going, yeah, I'm, I'm off the clock. I'm, I'm sorry, Peter. I'm off the clock. It's been a long day. Uh, just give her some water. She'll be fine. I'll, I'll, I'll check her out in the morning. Jesus never missed a moment to heal. He took care of her. He never took the Son of God hat off. And I'm, I'm just going to be Jesus for a while. There's always ministry. There's always showing the love of God. Verse 32, um, sundown. Now Sabbath is over. Okay? Sabbath ended at sundown on that day, okay? And so now people are free to go. They're free to walk. They're free to travel. They're free to work, okay? Healing was considered work. And so they gather. It's, it's sundown, and they start to gather at the house and bring to Jesus all who are sick and oppressed by demons because he can take care of them. Because he had cast out demons earlier. Um, we don't have any... You know, he doesn't get in trouble for violating the law yet, but we'll, that will come later on because you don't heal on the Sabbath day. Um, but there's nothing Jesus can't heal. There's no situation that he, can't, that he can't take care of. Never any limits on his healing. 
So they, they brought everybody. They got sick, oppressed by demons. And then verse 33, the whole city, it says, to get some context. Probably not the whole city of Capernaum was there, but um, it, it's just a rhetorical device just to, to show us there is a lot of people there. There is a lot of people at the door, okay? In chapter 2, shortly after this here, this house is filled as he's teaching and preaching. So this is, this is very common. Sabbath day, they're gathering to see Jesus. His fame is spreading. His fame is spreading. And in verse 34, he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. He would not permit the demons to speak. He continues to exercise the same authority that people saw him exercise in the synagogue earlier when he did. It was not a show for those in positions of power. This is who Jesus was. He healed. He took care of people. He healed many, it says. Not in the sense that he healed many, but not everybody. Um, he, healed a, he healed everybody. Anybody who showed up got healed. Not, not in the sense, yeah, it's about 10 o'clock. I'll take the next five people in line, to, and then everyone else come back. You, you've been in that line before, and you mean number six? That's frustrating. You think Jesus did that? No, he healed many. He healed everybody. Anybody who was there that night, they got a healing. You get a healing. You get a healing. We all get a healing. That's what happened. So look, let's, this is a long day, isn't it? It's a long day. I don't know about you, but I, I go through this. I'm tired. I'm tired thinking about what Jesus did on that Sabbath day. This is just one day. The next day is going to be the same, isn't it? So he, he's teaching God's word and, and proclaiming God's word, okay? Um, he's healing and serving the brothers and sisters. So those who are in the synagogue, those who are close to him, he's, he's caring for them, okay? So that like, like people taking care of people in the church. We can talk about that. He, he's having fellowship. There's a lot of people here at Living Word that love to go out to eat afterwards. Now that we can, things are opened up now, we can do that kind of thing. People like spending time together here. Not having fellowship time and coffee, coffee and cookies, that, that, that's, that's, that's killing us. <laughs> we, we, we like this. We like that. We like getting together. And then he, he heals and serves the needs of those who maybe don't know him. I mean, this would have been his custom. And it sounds like a pretty good recipe for ministry. But on the surface, it looks like hard work. And that's, but that's verse 35. I love the fact that Jesus does verse 35. I love it. I love the fact that Jesus does this. Rising early in the morning, while it's still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Still dark, he gets up, he goes. I did a word search of desolate place in my Bible program on my computer, and I got pictures of like rocky crevices and um, deserts and just nothing. No greenery, no animals, no people, no nothing. It's desolate. He didn't, he didn't go into the backyard. He didn't go around the corner to the park. I don't know if they had parks in Capernaum then, but he, he, he went out of town. He went out of the city to a desolate place. And there was nothing, okay? Nothing but him and the Father. Jesus retreated. I want to retreat just reading all that he did. He retreated. And this would have been, it's not just he did it here in verse 35, and then he, oh, I'm going to retreat later on here in you know, chapter 6. No, this would have been his custom. Whether he went off into the desert or he went to a different desolate place, whatever the case is. Um, he went away. And you just, just think of these other moments in his ministry when he does this, where scripture talks about him going away. Mark chapter 6, 46. Feeds the 5,000, sends the disciples out in the boat, walks in the water. Okay, so 
they're supposed to be, they're in a desolate place, they're supposed to have quiet time. People show up, he feeds them, sends the disciples out, dismisses the crowds, goes up the mountain, desolate, to pray by himself, then walks on water, which reveals his godness to them. Only He has authority over nature. That's a big, pretty big moment. Um, Luke chapter 5, following um, the, the gathering of great crowds, in which he healed people. He, he, went to, he went to a desolate place afterwards. Luke 6, 12. He prayed all night and chose 12 from among all the people following him, who he called apostles. That's a pretty big decision, isn't it? These are the 12 people who are going to be the foundation of the church when Jesus rises from the dead. He spends all night in prayer with the Father. Matthew 26, verse 39, the Garden of Gethsemane. Pretty big moment desolate place by himself. Do you have a desolate place? Well, of course, Pastor, we're in a pandemic. We've got to be socially distant. We're in our apartments by ourselves. That's not what I mean. It's one thing to be by yourself. What do you do? I have a couple desolate places. One of them is in here. This, this place is far from desolate, but during a week, shut the lights off, had the candle going, I have this spotlight here that's shining across, and I walk laps, and it's quiet. It's beautiful. Sometimes I'm, out, I'm praying, I'm talking through sermons. Maybe I make a pastoral care phone call, but it's beautiful. Other desolate place is my living room. Between 5 and 7 in the morning, kids get up at 7. So yeah, I get up early when it's dark. I'm not trying to copy Jesus, because... I think he's got the copyright in this, but um, but it's, it's quiet. It, it, it's I I feel ready to tackle the day when I when I have this time. But not everyone can do that. Yes, you may be alone, but the that's the place of just getting away, just you and the Father, just you and God. Work, and maybe it's not hours. Maybe it's five minutes, whatever it is. It's getting away. It's getting away. And we need that. We need that time. This is important for ministry. It's important for the Christian. It's important for the church. In some senses of the, of the word, the church has been in a desolate place for a while during this pandemic. I think the church is coming out of this here. You see, you see, you can't get your marching orders for ministry unless you spend time meeting with the general, right? You're not going to know what to do. You're not going to be comforted. You're not going to be encouraged. Martin Luther says, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Amen? We need to spend time with the general. What is it next? Verse 36. <laughs> Simon and those who were with him searched for Jesus. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. The word searched has the sense of to search eagerly or to hunt for. This was a diligent search. This was frantic. Where is he? Where? Jesus! Where? They couldn't find him. They were frantic. They needed to find him because there are people at the house. Peter saw an opportunity. We got to take care of these people. They're coming to us. We got a good thing going, Jesus. Yeah, hey, you know, I know I'm with, I'm with this guy. I'm with Jesus. Yeah, I'm. This is big. They're at the house. They want you. Got a good thing going. But Peter and the others are missing the big picture. Why? Because they have not spent time in the desolate place with God. They are focusing on the moment. Not the mission. Do you do that? Do you focus on the moment more than the mission? Do you focus on what's going on right now and the bigger picture? That's what causes anxiety, let me tell you. When something happens, we focus on that moment, we get anxious. But when you think of the big picture, this is what's going on here. Case in point, feeding of the 5,000. They're in a desolate place. 
They probably have a similar crowd as they have right now. It says 5,000 men, so probably around, I don't know, eight to 10,000 people with women and children. And what do they do? What do they, what do they tell Jesus? Oh, this is a desolate place. We can't feed them. Let's send them away. Get rid of the crowds. But now they've got the crowds here. They're going, Jesus, come back here. We've got all the crowds here. They're at home. They don't mind. They're more comfortable. Yeah, hey, we've got the people here. This is great. But Jesus shows us that true godly ministry that glorifies God. It's not about a place, but rather about the person. It's, about, it's not about what makes you comfortable, but rather what glorifies God and advances the gospel. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9, I have become all things to all people that I might, by all means, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul did not set up camp and stay there. He made the circuit. He preached the gospel where the people were at, becoming a servant a slave to them that they might be saved. It was about them. And he went out there because they weren't going to come to him. Just because he was, maybe he was a good pre preacher, they weren't going to come for miles around to find Paul. He had to go to them. The same with Jesus. Verse 38 and Jesus said to them, let's go. Not back to the house, but let's go on. Let's go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that's why I came out. That's why I came out. He came to preach the gospel, not to set up camp, not to acquiesce to the will of the people. Jesus came to go out there. Jesus came to save the lost. Jesus came to proclaim hope. Jesus came that we would live forever. Somebody mentioned in Bible study Thursday that the world needs Jesus. And just because the church says we have something good, the world's not going to come. I don't care how neat your buildings look or how flashy of a program you have, the world's not going to come. If they don't know Jesus, they're not, well, that church looks good. Let's go over there and see if we can learn about this Jesus guy. That's not what they're going to do. They're not going to come. The church has a mistaken notion that ministry is all about how we get people here. It's not about convincing sheep, but it's also not about convincing sheep from other folds that we have better food. A lot of churches do that. Come to this church here, you'll be fed greener grass. That's not expanding the kingdom. That's just shifting people around. That doesn't glorify God. We're about seeking and saving the lost. If they're lost, they're not going to come and find us. We've got to find them. That's what Jesus did. That's why he came. Because eventually, the people in Capernaum, they're not going to need healing anymore. Oh, we're fine. Jesus healed us already. Well, let's, let's go see this guy over here. A better program will come along. A fancier church will spring up. A more charismatic preacher will show up. There's always going to be something. Verse 39, And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. It is through this preaching that you have come to know that Jesus, that this Jesus, though you are a sinner, died on the cross and rose in the grave for the forgiveness of your sins that you would have the hope of everlasting life. Somebody came to you and told you that truth. Yes, I know this may sound very elementary knowledge, but this gospel truth can never be preached enough. Even for those who are PhDs in their faith, need kindergarten level knowledge that Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That should be our song. Jesus loves me, this I know. The Bible tells me so. So find your desolate place. Find that place, that time, that moment with God. And listen to the general. Receive your marching orders and go. 
It's really that easy. Becoming all things for all people that you might win some for God, thus saving their lives. That's what the mission is. That's what it is. Feed people with this truth. Heal people with the hope of the resurrection. Dwell in your desolate place. Live and proclaim the gospel. There you go. May this be your custom each and every day, O sinner, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And give glory to God with all that you say and do. All praise, worship, and thanksgiving be unto God our Father, through Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's children said, Amen. We've got some special music for you. This is our Living Word Choir singing a psalm, um, singing Psalm 100. It was arranged by Ron Mallory. He used to be the, the choir director here at Living Word um, back in the early days of Living Word here. Um, so here is the choir singing Psalm 100. Thank you, Dan and Mary Kay, for uh, providing that recording for us. So with that, we have heard the Word of God read, we've heard it proclaimed, and now let us confess our faith, and we'll do so using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Just a, a word about uh, offering. Um, thank you to the many who continue to give. And if you feel so moved to give an offering, I invite you to do that. You can go to our website and you can um, see that on there. 
and the giving page and all that. So thank you. Um, those offerings go to continue the ministry of this place. And um, so, yeah, thank you for, for your support and partnership in the gospel. Uh, let's prepare to join in prayer now. I don't have any brand new prayer updates here. Nothing's been submitted here, but just um, reminders here, some ongoing ones with um, Snooky Pancrats. Um, she has the, the cancer is kind of proceeding here and going through some new treatments that could cause some, um, some more side effects. She's had a really good goal of it. She's been dealing with this, but not dealing with any pain or any bad side effects. And, um, so yeah, she's going to go through a new round of chemo stuff, and so just continue prayers for her. Um, Bill Zavidal, um, he was in worship. He was in an in-person worship last week. Um, it was great to see him. Um, he is home recovering. Um, he's still got more to recover yet. Uh, he's got a pinched nerve in his back, and so he's going to be on a leave of absence from his job until the end of February. And so continued prayers for him as he heals. Just continued prayers for Cynthia Fall, too, um, going through um, stuff here with a... Uh, um, trying to get a, a bone marrow transplant, but found some visible cancer cells, and they want to get rid of those things before they can move forward. And so the transplant is it's still scheduled now for I think March 3rd. And so um, I haven't heard of any um, updates to that yet, but continued prayers for her as she goes forward. And so if you got prayer requests you want to include in the prayers on Sunday, please. You can email those to us. My email address or the church email address is there on the website or on, on the description of this worship video here, and you can send those in. So with that, let's, let's join together as a prayer. Father God, you have redeemed us through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, your dear Son. You have set us free from the grip of sin and death, you have given us the hope of the resurrection unto eternal life, and thus you have given us a new story. The old one has been done away with, crucified with the old Adam. We have much in which to be thankful. May this story be the one we joyfully live and share and proclaim. May it radiate from our very pores. May it ooze out of every nook and cranny of our life, so much so that people may see you in our see, see you in our good works, words, and deeds, and give glory to you through Christ Jesus our Lord. May the hope you have given us continue to draw us closer to closer to you, transforming us more and more into the likeness of your dear Son, our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we command our loved ones, family, and friends, and others in our lives to your healing hand. The many people we have in our Lifeline's prayer room, we continue to lift up to you. We continue to pray for Snooky as she goes through her cancer treatments. We pray that you may um, lessen the side effects and the pain, and that things may go smoothly. We boldly ask for complete healing, because we, we recognize you as our sovereign God. You are sovereign. You are the creator. You are more powerful than cancer. We know you can take it away. But your will be done. We continue to pray for Bill Zavidal. We give you thanks for the healing you brought him, that he's home now, out of the hospital, out of isolation. That we, we pray that um, the issues with his pancreas can be healed up, but now with the, the pinched nerve in his back, Please bring healing, O oh God, that he may return to work soon. And for Cynthia, as she goes through her treatments, and we pray that the transplant can proceed as planned in March now, and that there's no um, roadblocks to that. Bless her family who are caring for her. May they see your love displayed through her life. And we lift up to you anybody else we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Grant them healing, O oh God, in any way you see that they need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we live in two kingdoms. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we joyfully live in your everlasting kingdom. But as mortal beings in this world, we live in a finite kingdom of this world, 
ruled by sinful men and women. And so, O oh God, I pray for our president, vice president, senate, house of representatives, supreme court, state and local governments. I pray for all those in power and authority that they may rule with mercy and justice and without prejudice. I ask that you may transform their hearts and that they may be obedient to you. Speak the truth to them and may they rule rightly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, so many people have been impacted by this ongoing pandemic. Families are stressed, people are out of work, small businesses are fighting to stay open. Students are struggling with the uncertainties surrounding schools, sports, and extracurricular activities. All of this takes a toll, not just on those individuals, but all people. Oh God, bring healing and restoration to this world on such a scale that people have no choice but to attribute it to your mighty and gracious hand, thus giving you the glory. Give hope to the hopeless. Give strength to the weak. Give resources to the depleted. Give healing to the broken. Give life to your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, through your Holy Spirit, you knit your people together. And we take great comfort that Jesus is the head of the church and not sinful people. You raise up leaders and provide for the church that we may glorify you in this dark world. No one person is indispensable. No one person carries the body of believers on their own. It is you and only you, and thus create in us a greater faith and confidence that, though things may change over time, you are always in control. It is about your will being done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, to you be the glory. To you be all glory. To you be praise and worship. To you be all praise and worship. You alone are worthy of that worship. You alone are worthy of all worship. And so we raise our petitions to you and trust that you always hear us. You know the cares of our hearts. You know our deepest needs. You provide daily bread. You hold our lives in your hands. And so it's into your hands, O oh God, that we command all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, at this time, let's prepare to join together in the Holy Communion. If you're going to partake in that, I invite you to get your elements ready to go. Um, if you're not going to do that, you're not comfortable doing it in this fashion, that's okay. I encourage you to listen to the words and hear the words of promise that are proclaimed here. We are knit together and into one body. We are partaking in one holy spiritual food here. Um, we're hearing how Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. He spilled his own blood. He he's crucified, he died, and he was buried, and he, and he, and he, 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 he was risen for you. And so let's be fed. And so, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he broke it and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this. In remembrance of me. Joined together by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, the body of Christ, which has been given for you.
and now the blood of Christ, which has been shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Father God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this holy meal. Uh, body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, strengthen us now in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, let us sing. We have a closing hymn here today. Um, it's going to be LBW number 522, Come. Thou Almighty King. I invite you to receive the benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining um, us for worship here today, wherever you're worshiping from. Um, it's been great to have you here. Um, I pray um, blessings on your week as you go out and serve in the mission field. Spend time in your desolate place. Get your marching orders. Go out there and glorify God and share the light with a world that's in darkness. Let's praise God with how we live. And so with that, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.